Hello and welcome back to Psychopathology Lesson 2. This is part 2 of Lesson 2 and in this lesson we are going to have a look at behavioural explanations for phobias. So just a quick recap before I go on and introduce the topic. So it said in the title it's behavioural explanations for phobias. Okay, So that means that we're going to be looking very heavily at behaviourism and we're going to be using behaviourism to explain where phobias come from. So if you remember, behaviorism says that all behavior is learnt via our interaction with our environment. And they essentially say that all behavior comes from either classical conditioning, which is learning by association and was put out, out there by Pavlov that you can see there in his, you know, his famous study, Pavlov's Dogs. And then you have operant conditioning, which was put forward by Skinner. Um, and that was the whole Skinner's Rats study. OK, so if you can't remember those two things or you don't really know very much about behaviorism at the minute, I would suggest that before you carry on with this video, you go back and you have a little look at behaviorism and remind yourself um, of what that is. So in 1947, this guy, Orville Maurer, came along and he actually used the principles of classical and operant conditioning to try and explain where phobias come from and how phobias are maintained. And he suggested that phobias are learned and maintained through operant and classical conditioning. And he came up with what is now known as the two process model. And the two process model is what we are going to go through on the next couple of slides. So to start off with, we have the acquisition of phobias. And Maurer suggests that phobias are acquired through an association. Okay, so what that means is, is that they are acquired through classical conditioning. Okay, so if you remember from classical conditioning, it's all about associating a neutral stimulus with an unconditioned stimulus. And then that means that the neutral stimulus will turn into a conditioned stimulus, which will produce a conditioned response. Okay, so in this case, the neutral stimulus is something that we didn't used to be afraid of, and the unconditioned stimulus is something that already produces a fear response. Okay, so I'll give you an example through a study. In 1920, Watson and Rayner did a study um, on a baby, and the baby was known as Little Albert. Okay, it's now known as the Little Albert study. And in that study, Little Albert was conditioned to be afraid of a white rat. And the way that they did that was they introduced a white rat into the room. And then every time Little Albert went to reach for the white rat to touch it or pet it or whatever, they would make a really loud noise behind him by banging a hammer and a metal pipe together. OK, and they did this over and over again. And obviously the loud noise frightened Albert. Okay, but every time the white rat was introduced and every time Albert would reach for the white rat, they would make this loud noise, which would then result in Albert crying. Okay, because obviously he's afraid of the loud noise. Okay, so eventually what they found was that they introduced the white rat and even without them making a loud noise, Albert would start crying. Okay, so Albert had learned to associate the white rat with the loud noise and therefore the white rat had become the conditioned stimulus which was now producing the conditioned response of fear okay so they conditioned albert to be afraid of the white rat because albert now associates the white rat with the loud noise so even when the loud noise isn't there anymore albert is still afraid of the white rat okay let's have a look at a few more examples so a phobia of dogs could come about through being bitten. OK, so being bitten would be an unconditioned stimulus that produces fear, which is an unconditioned response. It's not something that you can control. Being bitten by a dog produces fear. It hurts. It's unpleasant. OK, so the dog, which was previously neutral, becomes associated with the unconditioned stimulus of being bitten. OK, so essentially, every time you see a dog, you think you're going to get bitten. And so the dog, which was neutral, now becomes the conditioned stimulus and produces fear. Because every time you see the dog, you think you're going to get bitten. OK, and that fear is the conditioned response. OK, so the dog has become associated with the bite. 
Another example um, could be social situations. So imagine one day you go out into a social situation and you have a panic attack. Panic attacks are terrifying. You, you feel like you can't breathe. So the social situation, which was previously neutral, becomes associated with the fear that you experienced that one time when you had a panic attack. And so the social situation becomes a conditioned stimulus, which produces a conditioned response of fear. And then finally, what you tend to find is that people will start to experience what's known as stimulus generalization. OK, so what that means is they will start to extend their fear to things that are similar. OK, so, for example, in the Little Albert study, Little Albert was then also afraid of general fluffy furry things. So they introduced a white rabbit and he was afraid of the rabbit. They introduced a fur coat and he was afraid of the coat. They even made the researcher come in wearing a Santa Claus mask and Little Albert was afraid of Santa Claus's beard. OK, so the stimulus, stimulus generalization there. Same with the dogs. You will start to be afraid of all dogs, not just the dog that bit you. And also social situations. It won't just be the social situation that you initially had the panic attack in. It will be in general social situations. OK, so that's known as stimulus generalization. And that is something that tends to happen with phobias. OK, um, I hope that's made sense in terms of how we acquire phobias and um, there's loads of examples of how this can work and a little bit later on I will show you some exam questions and show you how it's come up before with a variety of different examples. Okay but for now we will move on to the next little bit. Now generally any association that gets made will kind of just diminish over time they just kind of get less and less and less. However, with phobias, that doesn't tend to be the case. So Maurer suggested that our phobias are being maintained by using operant conditioning. OK, and the way that works, according to the two process model, is through avoidance. OK, so people, when they have a phobia, they tend to either avoid it completely or they try and escape from it as quickly as possible if they come across it. OK, now avoiding or escaping from the thing that you're afraid of produces feelings of relief and feelings of relief are rewarding. OK, it's negative reinforcement because I'm removing the thing that is unpleasant. I'm removing the thing that is frightening. OK, and if we know anything from operant conditioning, it's that behavior that is being rewarded or behavior that is being reinforced is going to be repeated. OK, and this is how people maintain their phobias. They either avoid them completely or they run away as quickly as they can when they come across it. They receive feelings of relief when they do that. And because that feeling of relief is rewarding, they repeat that behavior over and over and over again. And then because they're never actually in the same place as the thing that they're afraid of for any long period of time, it means that they're never actually dealing with their phobia, which means that their phobia is being reinforced and reinforced and reinforced and reinforced. And so it's going to get maintained and maintained and maintained. So that was the very simple two process model of acquiring and maintaining phobias. OK, we're now going to move on to some evaluation points. I've got four for you um, to have a look at. Three of them are written out nicely for you and the fourth one isn't. But you'll see why when I get there. So the first evaluation point that we're going to have a look at is the application to therapy and it is a strength. OK, so these behaviorist ideas have been used to develop treatments, um, for example, systematic desensitization and flooding. And both of these therapies work in a very similar way. They both help people to unlearn their fears and they use the principles of classical conditioning, but they also prevent people from avoiding their phobias. And if they can prevent people from avoiding their phobias, then they can prevent negative reinforcement from taking place.
Okay, so consequently, these therapies have been very, very successful in treating people with phobias, which then provides support for the effectiveness of the behaviorist explanation for phobias. Okay, so that's the first one. It's a nice evaluation point to use. It's got good real world application. I would definitely suggest that you use this. Okay, second one is research support for classical conditioning. Okay, and for this one, you can use the Little Albert study. Okay, I went through the Little Albert study a little bit earlier, so you should be able to make your own um, peel paragraph for this. Um, but just remember, Watson and Rayner, 1920, they demonstrated the process of classical conditioning in the formation of a phobia. And then all you would have to do is explain what they did and what the conclusion was. OK, so this provides research support for classical conditioning in the acquisition of phobias. OK, it's only for classical conditioning. It's not research support for operant conditioning, just classical. OK, and you also have to be a little bit aware that as this was a case study, it's a little bit difficult to generalize the findings to other children or even adults because it was quite a unique investigation. But still, in general, it provides research support for classical conditioning. OK, so nice study and also one that I would definitely suggest that you use. OK, so moving on, we've got a couple of weaknesses as well. The first weakness is something known as biological preparedness. OK, so this is this idea that behavioral theories may not provide a complete explanation for phobias. So, for example, you had Bounton in 2007 who highlighted the fact that evolutionary factors could also play a role in phobias. OK, particularly if the avoidance of particular stimuli could have increased survival chances for our ancestors. OK, so consequently, evolutionary psychologists have actually suggested that we are predisposed to some phobias like snakes or spiders or heights and that these phobias are in fact innate rather than learnt. And they're innate because they acted as a survival mechanism for our ancestors. OK, so a lot of people are afraid of heights, even though they've never had um, a particular bad experience with heights. A lot of people have a phobia of snakes, even though they've never been bitten by a snake or they've never had a particular negative experience with snakes. And the, and the explanation for that is biological preparedness, which is, like I just said, this idea that certain phobias are innate. OK, um, and this theory of biological preparedness was put forward by Seligman in 1971, and it is a limitation because it casts doubt on the two process model, um, since it suggests that there is more to phobias than just learning. OK, it's a nice one to have as well. It's more of a discussion point. Um, it's a, quite a complicated point, but it is a very, very powerful point if you can remember it, particularly for discussion essays rather than simple outline and evaluate essays. OK, and then our final point is the fact that the two process model ignores cognitive aspects to phobias. OK, um, so there's an alternative explanation for phobias in the cognitive approach, and the cognitive approach suggests that phobias may develop as a consequence of irrational thinking. So, for example, a person who is stuck in a lift might think that they could become trapped and therefore suffocate in the lift. That is an irrational thought. However, that irrational thought could lead to extreme anxiety and could also trigger a phobia. Now, the value of this particular explanation is that it's led to cognitive therapies such as cognitive behavior therapy. And cognitive behavior therapy is in some cases, like social phobias, much more successful than behaviorist treatment. OK, so it is a definite weakness of the behaviorist approach that it ignores cognitive factors, OK, such as irrational thoughts, which could trigger a phobia. Now, obviously, there are loads of evaluation points um, that you could use, depending on which book um, you are using and depending which evaluation points your teacher thinks um, is good. There are loads and loads of good evaluation points that you could use. You don't have to use my ones. Um, I've just given you two strengths and two limitations to cover kind of all of the bases. And the ones that I've chosen 
I personally think are quite good. But like I said, you might want to choose different ones um, and your teacher might want to choose different ones as well. However, whichever ones you choose, make sure that you have peeled them properly and make sure that you have a nice mix of strengths and limitations. So before we finish off, just a couple of exam questions for you. Now, as you can imagine, this topic is perfect for application questions, as you can see in the first question on the screen there. OK, so in that question, it would want you to use the behavior of approach to explain how Kirsty has acquired a phobia of balloons. OK, so it would want you to talk about the fact that balloons were previously a neutral stimulus, but they've become associated with an unconditioned stimulus and it now produces a conditioned response because the balloon has become a conditioned stimulus and so on and so on. OK, so they want, to, want you to talk about the association that's been made. Um, but equally, you can get short answer questions as well. So you can get very simple outline a behavioral explanation for phobias. OK, that can be for two marks, but it could also be for six marks. So you need to make sure that you can talk about it very, very short um, and concisely, but also that you can elaborate on it as well. Same goes for evaluation questions, which could come up as a short answer question for this topic. Um, finally, essays are also very, very popular um, for this particular topic, and they do get set fairly regularly. I'm not putting an essay title up there because they're all the same. It's either outline and evaluate behavioral explanations for phobias, or it's some kind of application essay. So if you want to write one, you could just imagine that the question about Kirsty is actually an essay. And then instead of the question that's there, just say, outline and evaluate the behaviorist approach for phobias, refer to Kirsty in your answer. OK, the important thing with essays on this topic, though, is that you don't waste time going into unnecessary detail about classical and operant conditioning. OK, save classical and operant conditioning for an essay on the behaviorist approach. You will only get credit if you talk about those two processes in relation to phobias. So focus on the basic principles that I've gone through in this video. Talk about the two process model, talk about how classical conditioning helps us to acquire a phobia and talk about how operant conditioning helps us to maintain a phobia. OK, but don't go into detail about what classical and operant conditioning are without mentioning phobias. Okay, because you won't get credit for it. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Right, and that is the end of the video. So I hope everything's been clear, um, particularly with the exam questions um, at the end and with some of the longer evaluation points. I realize that some of them are a little bit convoluted, um, but they are good, strong evaluation points that you can use. Okay, so thank you very, very much for listening, and I hope it's been useful. Thank you.